welcome everybody watching on uh, YouTube to a short late night episode of Speedrun. Now we have the Black Pieces against Hell Usher from India. Okay, we get a Sicilian. We get a Sicilian. Okay, and again, our opponent is already thinking. Now I'm afraid that everybody's going to disconnect against me. Okay, Knight F3. So obviously we're following the Knight Orf moves, D6. And our first open Sicilian of the speedrun. Thus far, we have mostly faced the Baudler attack, either uh, on this move or on the previous move. The move Bishop C4 is extremely common among uh, lower rated players. But finally, uh, we're getting an open Sicilian, so we capture on D4. But let's not count our blessings yet, because it's entirely possible that Queen takes D4 is played. Nope, our opponent plays Knight takes D4. Looks like we're going to get a Knight Orf. Knight C3, A6, our first Knight Orf of the speedrun. Big moment. And we're facing a third-rate sideline, Knight F3. Now, with an opening like the Knight Orf, and I have played this in previous speedruns, I can't show you everything at once. There is a tremendous amount of theory. Uh, in this position, White has at the very least 10 viable options that I actually spelled out in the previous speedrun uh, to kind of illustrate that in certain positions, there's a major branching off point, and you have to be well prepared against a wide variety of different moves. I've seen uh, the move Knight F3 before. Um, I've seen this before. This has been played by some GMs, but it's not a particularly testing move. White is immediately withdrawing the Knight from the center. Clearly, it's not all that ambitious, but it kind of asks us a question. How do we want to develop our pieces with black? Well, the first important kind of general conceptual point in the Knight Orf is that Knight Orf setups are divided into two categories. There's category one where you push the pawn two squares, e7, e5, and this is going to be our response to bishop e3. It's going to be our response to bishop e2. And then there's kind of the second category of knight orf setups where you push the pawn only one square. In some positions, you have to play e6. In other positions, you have a choice between these two moves. But for the time being, we don't really need to commit our e-pawn. We kind of can wait for white to put our cards on the table. And in some positions, you can actually choose to Fianchetto, your bishop instead. But let's start by simply developing our knight. Knight c6. I actually do not like uh, the move e7, e5 in this position, and I'll explain why after the game. If you're watching this and you're new to the knight orf, you shouldn't feel too overwhelmed. You might be kind of confused right now. What am I talking about? e5 doesn't this weaken the d5 square. I will explain everything in due course, right? So you're not going to understand everything immediately. We're facing the move e5. I'm not sure what this is. This simply gives up a pawn, and we can take it two different ways. I like knight takes e5. I like knight takes e5 because this encourages another trade. And after the trade on e5 and the trade on d8, you might be saying, but aren't we losing our ability to castle? Doesn't white get a big initiative? Not really. Not really. Why not? Well, two reasons. First of all, white is not very well developed, so it's not like white can immediately pile on pressure on our king. The other big reason is that our king can evacuate to this very nice square on c7. It's got a home on that square. And here you can begin to see the power of this move a6, which always comes in handy in a lot of these knight orf positions. The basic point of the move a6 is that it covers the b5 square. Combined with the knight on f6, which covers the d5 square, uh, we have a beautiful home for our king on c7. What is the order of operations here? We also need to make sure that uh, we have the capacity to protect the e5 pawn because I'm anticipating castles king side by white, and then white can try to quickly put a rook on e1 and put pressure on our pawn. So we need to be clever and very purposeful about the order in which we develop. I like starting with e6 here because this gives us the ability to bring the bishop out to d6, protecting the pawn on e5. At this point, we can play bishop d6, but I think it's more flexible to play king c7, parking our king on uh, the kind of ideal square where the king is largely unassailable. And rook e1 can now be met with bishop to d6. Um, now you might be thinking, well, wait a second, why can't we, for example, drop our knight back to d7? But that's a very awkward move that in most cases we're going to try to avoid. What are we going to do with this bishop? Well, this bishop has several options. It can reroute to c6, but for the time being, we can bring it out to d7. f4. Yeah, our opponent is actually playing pretty decently. So <clears throat> our opponent's idea is that if we trade, uh, he brings the bishop out with check. 
which could be potentially nasty and it could spoil the party uh, on C7. So <clears throat> here we apply the classic concept of trading on our own terms. Instead of taking on F4, we want to encourage our opponent to take on E5. So what is kind of the obvious way of setting that up? Well, it's bishop d6. It's bishop d6. <clears throat> Trade, and now we're totally good. Our bishop is nicely parked in the center, and if white plays bishop f4 here, and then we simply trade on f4. And the more trades happen, the better it is for us, because we are up a pawn. Let's not forget that. We've also just undoubled our pawns on the e-file, so now we have a 4 versus 2 majority on the king side. Knight e4. Excellent move by our opponent. So the point is that if we play knight takes e4, then uh, the attentive viewer will notice that white can actually snap off the pawn on f7 with check. That's called an intermediate move, and it's a very nasty one. Then white takes on e4. That's bad. So the big question here is, does white actually have a threat? Right. So this is a scary looking move, especially when you figure out its idea. But if you ask yourself, what is white's threat? It, it's, it becomes clear that this is actually not such a terrifying move. And you can simply proceed with whatever it is you were intending on the previous move, which in our case is completing the development. How do we do that? Well, there's really only one way, bishop to d7. Perhaps some of you were intending to fianchetto the bishop. I think that's too slow. I think the priority here should be uh, connecting the rooks. And we can always get the bishop onto the long diagonal via c6. Okay, so here we can take either way. We can play bishop takes, we can play pawn takes. Um, most of you will probably be leaning toward not damaging the pawn structure, but my inclination is actually pawn takes f6. And I will talk about this more deeply after the game. We don't have time right now. I'm going to write this down. But one of the big reasons is that this, well, there's two major reasons. The first is that we get the G file and we have the prospect of an end game attack. An end game attack, you might say, well, what are we going to be attacking? Look at this G2 pawn. Right? In, com in conjunction with our light squared bishop, which, which can come on to c6, um, it only takes two moves to create a devastating threat against this pawn. So it's not like we're playing for checkmate. We're more playing for like a long-term attack and perhaps some tactics on the king side. So we could start with the move f5, um, which restricts the bishop and kind of builds this weird pawn chain, which is actually really, really annoying for white to deal with. But there's no rush. We can start with bishop c6. And if you're scared of bishop f4, Concretely, that doesn't work out. We take on f4, and then we push f5, and this is the second major reason. This particular pawn structure occurs in several openings. It occurs in the Scandi, in the Karokan, and it's actually a lot better than it looks because all of the pawns are defending each other. The only major drawback of the structure is that the h7 pawn is isolated. Yeah, that's, that's a drawback for sure, but it's not a reason for us not to go for this. a4. So that's a pretty empty move. Um, now we can start activating our rooks. That's the clear next step. Which rook do we activate? We can start with rook hg8, but a better idea is to start with rook ad8. Because, as I've said many times, if there's only one open file on the board uh, and you're able to control it, uh, that very, very often leads to immediate material gains. And it often leads to, just in general, a quick victory. Rook d2 is automatic. And at the very least, we're going to win a second pawn. At the very least. Let's take on f3. Let's trade the bishops to clarify this. Okay, pawn takes f3. And here's the perfect example of... Okay, actually, this is, a, is an interesting endgame position. Because paradoxically, I know a lot of you, most of you, are very tempted to get the other rook onto the second rank. But amazingly, if you actually calculate, you will find that this is not as convincing as it looks. Why not? Because after rook g8, king h1, rook g to g2... White has this very little move, rook h4. And that's incredibly annoying because it protects the h2 pawn. So the king on h1 is actually safer than it looks. And suddenly, the pawn on h7 can't be safely protected. We're going to have to drop the rook back to g7, or we're going to have to give the h7 pawn up, which gives our opponent a passed pawn. The big question here is why? Why do we need to allow any sort of counterplay when we can simply grab the pawn on b2? We can simply take the pawn. And there's absolutely no rush to get our other rook onto the second rank. Rook c4 check. Okay, where do we hide our king? This is not the kind of position in which the king is going to play a particularly active role. So I propose dropping it back to b8. I think our rooks are going to be doing the heavy lifting here. We don't want to just like 
mindlessly walk ourselves into a series of checks. That's exactly how you get in trouble. And now at this point, we have essentially a choice of ways in which we can win the game. Um, I think the simplest is probably just to trade rooks and then immediately without delay, getting the other rook onto the open file and targeting either these two very weak queenside pawns or at some point these isolated kingside pawns. What is the perfect square from which we can do that? Well, again, there are several options, but there is a way to win this pawn by force. Does anybody see it? So a lot of you are probably thinking rook d4, but then white plays rook b1 and protects the pawn. Oftentimes, it's best to attack a pawn from behind, which is the way to ensure that it cannot be defended. Yes, we start with a check. Very concrete move. On the one hand, we're helping the white king get closer to the center, but the point of this move is just to win the b4 pawn. Yeah, exactly. So notice how concretely we're actually playing in the endgame. We're mostly relying on calculation, not really our general endgame understanding. Now, again, there's many, many ways to win this position. We don't need to win any more pawns, but I think the easiest approach is going to be to use our extensive pawn majority on uh, in the center on the king side. We're going to use that pawn majority to deflect the white rook from a1. Once the rook is deflected from a1, uh, the easiest approach will involve going after this pawn on a5, at which point we'll have another set of pass pawns on the king side, on the queen side. Uh, the other approach, by the way, is to play b6. Uh, and immediately create a pass pawn. But I think there's no rush to do that. Let's go e5. Let's go e5. And just kind of watch how I win this position. We've got 90 seconds, so I'm going to be a little bit faster. We don't need to play h5. Now, best way to defend a pawn is with another pawn, so let's go f6. Alternatively, we could have already played rook b5, but there is largely no rush. In fact, a Russian schoolboy method is to start with a rook b3. Classic. Uh, idea in the end game that you should kind of um, you should kind of file away into your mental database. You laterally pin a pawn and then use your own pawn uh, to win the pawn like so. Very very commonly missed, uh, even at the high level. Not like in a position like this, but it can creep up all of a sudden. Okay, rook f1. And what is the easiest path to victory? The easiest path to victory is of course to force the pawn end game. But in this position, we have one last instructive moment. Because a lot of you, especially those of you who've watched my pawn endgame videos, you might identify this construction as a deep freeze, where one pawn uh, tackles or essentially paralyzes two pawns or more. But in reality, it's not really paralyzing our pawns. What we can do is we can still play b6. This is called a pawn breakthrough. Yeah, it's technically a pawn sacrifice. But it's very obvious that the b6 pawn causes us absolutely no harm. And now the a pawn is promoted. Now, how do we win this? The easiest way to win this is to engineer a scenario where after white pushes the pawn to h6, white is in Zugzwang. So we can start with queen f6. And there is a very elegant way to win this. We actually have checkmate in three moves. We have checkmate in three moves. Very good theme for people to know. Check. The easier way to win would be king b7. This would cause Zugzwang because white would have to separate the king from the pawn. But if we play king b7 here, we force white uh, to dig his own grave. And queen f8 is going to be checkmate. There's a lot of these little subtleties in queen versus pawn ga end games that uh, are pretty good to know. OK, nice. So I have to compliment our opponent. Our opponent played really well. This was not an easy game. Obviously, I burned like two minutes in this position, just trying to set some context, but still well done by our opponent. Let's kind of quickly go through the critical moments. Um, we will get plenty of night orfs throughout the speed run. There's no sense in, you know, boring people to death with a bunch of opening theory. Um, for this video, let me just kind of quickly lay out. I'll give you kind of the roadmap of what are the big lines? What are my recommendations against them? And what are the sort of very big bird's eye level ideas that uh, you have to be aware of? So the Nidorf is delineated by this move, a6. This is what actually makes the Nidorf the Nidorf. Um, there's several alternatives in this position. The Rouser, the Dragon, uh, Hikaru in round one of the candidates against Fabi played a line that I think has no name, which is the immediate e5. And Fabi's response to this move, which is 
sort of considered to be the refutation of e5, really gets at the heart of why a6 is important. For those of you who've been watching the candidates, you probably know uh, Bobby's response and the correct move. Who can remind me of White's proper response in this position? It's not knight db5. It's not knight db5 because then we just send the knight to a3 and we get kind of like an improved Sveshnikov. Um, it's bishop b5 check. Yes, it's bishop b5 check. And the point of this move is actually very, very simple. Um, you're trying to induce the trade of light squared bishops. Why is the trade of light squared bishops good for... Uh, why is the trade of light squared bishops good for white? For the simple reason that the d5 square is much harder to defend when the bishops are off the board. So for example, if we play knight b takes d7, look how ugly this position already is. And it gets even uglier um, if you're not ultra precise. This pawn is hanging. Okay, let's say we play knight c5. And what is the best move for white? Who can tell me? You should pause the video if you're watching on YouTube. This is a good opportunity for you to kind of review your positional basics. I call this the Smyslov idea, named after kind of the STEM game where this idea is most famously applied. This is nothing special, just kind of a basic positional concept. Who knows the best move for white? Yes, cartoon book nerd got it. So it's not F3. F3 is okay. That's an okay move, but there is a much more effective way of checking two boxes at once. You want to protect this pawn, but you also want to fight for the d5 square. What does it mean to fight for the d5 square? Well, you can add attackers to the square, or you can eliminate defenders, and the latter can be achieved with the move bishop g5. So this develops the bishop, it pins the knight, but most importantly, it prepares bishop takes f6. Why do I call this the Smith's Love idea? Because one of the most famous uh, examples that is often shown to, um, in like the Russian school of chess, is the following game from the 1940s, played by Smyslov, who later would become world champion. Smyslov versus Rudakovsky, 1945. I've shown this before on stream. What is White's best move? What is White's best move? Bishop g5. Yeah, bishop g5, of course. And the point is very simple. You are trying to eliminate this knight and fight for the d5 square. So this concept of trading off pieces in order to fight for a weak square is kind of at play here. Rook fe8, trade, and knight d5. And notice how tactics are seamlessly interwoven into this idea. You might say, well, doesn't this blunder a pawn? Well, it gives away the pawn, but there's a tactical refutation to queen takes c2, which is to start with rook f2 uh, so that uh, the b2 pawn isn't captured. And the point is that black's queen has to stay on the c-file, otherwise you're going to fork the two rooks. No matter where it goes, you bring the other rook into the action, and no matter where the queen goes, you fork the two rooks winning in exchange. Okay, so that's the basic, uh, basic concept here, and you can kind of observe the parallel in our speedrun game. And this is much the same, right? No matter what black does, you're basically going to take on f6 and slam another knight into d5. All of that is a very long-winded way of saying the point of a6, by and large, is to avoid this idea and to prepare e5 in many cases. Um, and in general, in a lot of Sicilian positions, the b5 square is a very important transit point for white's pieces. So that's kind of where the knight orf originates from. And by the way, I didn't finish listing the possibilities. There's also the Chevenin again, which is e6, which is by and large kind of out of fashion now, but still occasionally played. Um, so what is the history of the knight orf? When was it first played? Um, let's give it a quick search. So the Knight of this move A6 first originated in the year, um, 1926. It was first played not by Nidorf, but by Savelli Tartakower, who was a French-Russian grandmaster, one of the strongest players of the early 20th century. He played this first, and Nidorf only picked it up, let's see when the first Nidorf game was in this variation. 1939, Nidorf played it in the Olympiad. And Nidorf was really the first to kind of say, wait a second, guys, this is actually a pretty serious variation. Like people were kind of playing it frivolously, but Nidorf, I think, might have wrote, written an article uh, or played a lot of games in this variation. And ultimately, it came to be known as the Nidorf. I see some games from the 40s, from the 50s. Nidorf basically played it for his entire career. And a good illustration that a line isn't always named after the person who first played it but after the person who contributed the most knowledge 
um, or was the earliest to kind of understand that that opening uh, is a serious one. Okay, so you can argue about uh, naming conventions in chess, but just a little bit of history. So what are White's big options in this position? The most popular move from uh, the 1950s to today is bishop to g5. Uh, this is also widely considered the most dangerous line and the line that you have to know the best, uh, theoretically speaking, as a knight or player. You have to do some memorization if you want to play the knight or seriously, and you have to choose a line and be very well prepared against bishop g5. Uh, my recommendation here will be to play e6. Um, typically, white responds with f4, and we enter a very, very extensive theoretical waters. This line has been studied uh, very deeply, and I'm sure that we're going to get games in this variation. Uh, there are many, many other lines that you have to know. There's bishop e3. Here, I will recommend e5. And in general, when humanly possible, I will recommend pushing the pawn two squares. But against certain variations, e5 is a very bad idea. For instance, the fischer sozin attack, which I'm sure we're also going to face, um, essentially forces us to play e6, because here e5 is positionally way too dubious. The d5 square is now completely under white's control. Already knight g5 is a huge threat, and uh, we don't want to play e5 when the bishop is on c4. If, however, white plays the Karpov variation, bishop e2, here I will be, in fact, recommending e5. Against f3, the English attack, I also recommend e5. And then there's like a wide variety of different uh, lesser popular lines like h3, popular at the top level, but I don't think we're going to face this until much, much later in the speedrun. Here I also like e5. And then rook g1, um, a move that was virtually unknown until the 90s. Ivanchuk played it a bunch. Now it's kind of making a comeback at the, at the top level. I will also recommend e5. And typically, the way that you follow up e5 is by bringing the light squared bishop up to e6. Um, there are some theoretical subtleties. So for instance, in this line, you actually are supposed to start with bishop e7. And I'm not going to delve uh, any more deeply into these subtleties right now. But just understand that learning an opening like the knight Earth is a step-by-step -step process. Um, there's a lot of theory, there's a lot of ideas that you have to learn just to get your head above ground, um, not even to talk about like, serious opening study. And I'm going to try to use the games that we play uh, to give you that knowledge in bite-sized pieces. Okay, So in this game, we face knight f3, I think pretty clearly improvisation by our opponent, and we just develop our knight to c6. Here, there's absolutely no need to push the e-pawn, and pushing e5 is kind of dubious here because the light squared bishop can be brought up to c4 in one fell swoop. e6 maybe allows this nasty little move e5. And we definitely don't want to get into the send game if we're not going to win a pawn along the way. For that reason, we decided on knight c6. OK, e5 is kind of dumb. Um, not really sure what else uh, white is supposed to do here. Maybe bishop g5. Although here we definitely can play e6 and bishop e7, and we have kind of a really, really nice version. I would say a toothless version of the bishop g5 line, because white's already supposed to have a pawn on f4. And without it, this is not uh, dangerous in the least. So white plays e5. We trade. We trade, we trade. Bishop to d3, OK. And e6. OK, white castles. We park our king on this lovely square. And white decides to attack our pawn directly with f4. Um, again, if white had played rook e1, we would have defended with bishop d6. So f4, we still play bishop d6, trading on our own terms. Trade on e5, knight e4, and bishop d7. Actually, very big moment uh, for people to pay attention. Right? I didn't panic just because there was a tactic in the air. So we spotted that knight e4 runs into this intermezzo. And a lot of people, having seen that, will overreact and do something you know, irrational. But apart from understanding the idea of a move, you also have to understand what the threat is. So a great question to ask is, what is our opponent's next move? So let's say we make a random move like rook b8. There actually is a threat here. White does have a threat. Can anybody spot it? Actually, there might be like one and a half threats. I can guarantee all of you are thinking knight g5. Actually, no, people are saying the right move. Yeah, it's not knight g5 because this is just a one move threat. We can play rook f8. 
and maybe white can grab the pawn on h7, but this just looks very dubious to me. The bigger threat is actually bishop f4, and okay, now we have to trade. And unfortunately, we're running into the same problem where the knight is now attacked twice. And if the knight moves, again, white has this intermediate check. So how does bishop d7 address this threat? If white plays bishop f4, let's compare. What can we do in this position that we couldn't do in the previous one? The answer is we can play knight takes e4. This is no longer a check. We can just move our knight. And if white recaptures on e4, this gives us the time that we need, obviously, to defend the pawn by pushing it for example, twice to f5. So good example of concrete thinking, right? Identifying a threat and your default response should be the move that you were planning to play on the previous move. Okay, so white plays knight f6. We take with a pawn. I think I explained this pretty decently uh, during the game. Uh, apart from all of the reasons that I pointed out, I also didn't want to let the bishop come out with check. And if we block with a pawn, why are we getting ourselves into this situation where the rook is coming to e1 um, and perhaps the light squared bishop is coming to c4. So g takes f6 keeps this bishop very nicely centralized. And like I said, this particular structure occurs in many different other openings. For example, in the Harakan, there is a variation where black, it's now considered to be, it's kind of largely discredited, but still very, very good at lower levels. G takes f6. Okay, you can kind of, See how familiar this pawn structure is, then oftentimes the light squared bishops kind of get traded and you get this exact same pawn structure. And if white castles prematurely to the king side, you often get kind of exactly what we got in the game. You get this g-file attack and eventually the pawn from f6 moves up to f5 and all of these pawns defend each other. You actually get a visually unappealing, but in reality, very, very effective and solid pawn structure. In the French, you can also get this. In the um, classical variation, white plays bishop g5, black plays d e4, knight e4, bishop e7, bishop f6, g f6, one of the main lines considered to be perfectly viable for black. In fact, after knight f3, the main move is just the immediate f5. Um, and this is why I often say pawn structure is overrated, um, because you should not look at pawn structure in a vacuum. You should try to understand it in larger context. And it's not just about how visually appealing your pawns look, it's also about how well defended they are. And this is the perfect illustration. The pawns visually unappealing, but extremely well defended and solid as a rock, let alone the fact that we now get the G file to attack the G pawn. Okay, so A4, another mistake. We bring our rook to the open file. We get our rook to the second rank. And here an important moment where we refrained from the obvious rook G8 and rook G2 because I was aware of what my biggest weakness is. And we spotted rook h4, which is actually a really, really nasty move. And suddenly white gets unnecessary counterplay. There's a threat of taking this pawn with check. It's not a disaster. We can move our king out of the way. But why are we giving white a free pass pawn um, when that can be easily avoided just by not, not moving our rook, uh, but instead just going after the pawns? OK, so rook c4, we move our king back. Also notice I'm not just like blindly following the rule of getting our king into the center in the end game. That's not always going to be the case. King d6 makes no sense. It just helps white activate their rooks. So here we just park our king on the safest possible square. Oh, sorry. White invites the rook trade. Why not? We get our, oh, sorry. We get our other rook to the open file. And now we go behind the pawn in order to pick it up. Then we use our major pawn majority f6, rook b3, lateral pin. If white had dropped the king back, we would have gone rook a3, same theme, to win another pawn, then we'd be four pawns up. But instead, white allows the transition into the pawn endgame. And the final idea is uh, breaking the deep freeze with a classic pawn breakthrough. OK, so that's, I think, enough on this game. That was your introduction to the night earth. Hopefully, in the next night earth game, we actually face a mainstream uh, response. By the way, I also didn't mention f4. Uh, here, I also recommend e5. OK, let's play one more game, and then we'll call it a knight. Black pieces and another Sicilian. Here we go. And we'll have, OK, c4. So yet again, we're facing a very offbeat and pretty dubious line. c4 is, it's OK. It's not as bad as it may look to some people. You might think this is just like a terrible move. 
that weakens the d4 square. If white follows it up properly, uh, c4 is actually an acceptable line, but at this level, most people don't follow it up properly. Okay, so the first step is to cement our control over the d4 square. And I think I've already mentioned what kind of setup I like to counter uh, this type of e4 and c4 setup. Um, if you're a knight orf player, uh, it doesn't mean that you can never fianchetto your bishop, right? This is the important insight. As a Sicilian player, you have to be ready uh, to respond to what your opponent is doing uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, right? You shouldn't identify kind of as a Sveshnikov player or a knight orf player, and, and that means like you never play a dragon setup. Uh, this is a perfect illustration of that. The bishop in this position belongs uh, on g7, uh, which should be pretty clear to, uh, to most of you because this is just uh, where you want to go. Uh, the bishop helps solidify our control of the d4 square. And in general, against these e4, c4 setups, I really, really like uh, fianchettoing the bishop. Um, there's just no other good spot for the Like, where else are you going to put the bishop? Are you going to put it on e7? e6, bishop e7 just looks awkward and passive. Also, this bishop is going to start complaining. So let's fianchetto. And now we play d6, opening up the diagonal for this bishop and d3. Okay, so here we continue to play positionally. There's many, many good moves. Um, you can play knight f6 and continue your development. But if we try to play this as thematically as possible, that means we really want to fight uh, for the d4 square as concretely as possible. And the way to do that, of course, is to bring the bishop to g4. Um, and potentially to give it up for the knight. So this violates uh, the one of the basic opening principles. We're moving the same piece more than once in the opening. But clearly, this is not the kind of position where, um, where this principle is going to be uh, that important. It's not like white is rushing to develop their pieces. We can definitely afford uh, to violate this principle uh, for the very important cause of cementing our control of d4. Now the interesting thing is that most of you probably are, are itching to put a knight on d4, but there's actually no rush to do that at all. There is zero rush to play the move knight to d4. White drops the queen back to f2. It's actually not that scary for white. It's much better, I think, to keep this move in your pocket, kind of waiting for a more unpleasant moment. For example, uh, first of all, let's start with e6, bringing the knight to e7. If white thoughtlessly plays bishop e2, which is not unlikely, then knight d4 simply wins the game. White plays bishop e3. Okay, white sidesteps that trap. But already I'm starting to kind of look at this knight on c3. The pawn on b2 is now a weakness. So the move queen, queen to b6 comes to mind. But still, I don't think that we should go for anything speculative here. Uh, some of you might want to play queen a5, but then white can just protect the knight with rook c1. Uh, so why did we actually play e6? Um, it was to control the d5 square, but it was also to prepare a nice little window uh, of development for the knight on e7. Uh, this setup you should kind of burn into your memory. I, I call it the Botvinnik setup. I think Botvinnik was one of the first to really highlight its virtues. And this is the setup that you carry out against a wide variety of different anti-Sicilians. And when I say anti-Sicilians, I'm referring to essentially all alternatives to uh, the open Sicilian, knight f3 and d4. So against a lot of them, uh, such as the closed Sicilian, uh, the Grand Prix attack, um, like e4, c5, d3, uh, your default is the Botvinnik setup, where you fianchetto your dark squared bishop, and then in order to not obstruct its diagonal, uh, the knight from g8 is developed to e7. That's you know, an easy way to put it. Okay, now we continue by castling. Notice that we still have not put the knight on d4 because there is still absolutely no rush. And now our, well, depending on what white does, I'm assuming that our opponent's gonna keep developing their inside pieces. Um, there is a, okay, back to F3. So you can see that our opponent has no idea what to do, which further justifies our decision not to play knight t4. So already at this point, I think we can try to punish white for uh, these shenanigans. And there's many ways to do that. I, at this point, like the move queen a5, not just because it attacks the knight on c3, but also because it furthers our main plan. Um, okay, bishop to d2. Wow, our opponent is moving a lot of the same pieces again and again. Now, when I say main plan, what am I referring to? 
there is a very typical plan in these types of positions. Um, and I don't like using that phrase, but it's, it's hard to talk about. When I say these types of positions, I'm largely referring to like the Botvinnik setup. When you put this Botvinnik setup together, uh, the next step is often queenside expansion uh, with a very particular type of plan where you play the move a6, and you're basically preparing the b7, b5 pawn break. Um, eventually, the pawn moves up to b4, forcing the knight away from c3 and leading to an expansion of this long diagonal, as well as a potential pawn storm on the, king si on the queen side. Um, and this is a typical plan across many different openings. Uh, the, the big thing is, as long as you have this particular setup, a6 and b5 should be at the top of your mind. We're just going to play a6. Why am I not afraid of the discovered attack against our queen? Because there is no scary discovered attack. My guess is that our opponent might go knight d5. But that is absolutely, it actually plays into our hands. Remember, what is the point of pushing this pawn up to b4? It's to get this knight off of c3. Why are we trying to get the knight off of c3? Well, we're trying to increase the influence of our bishop and ultimately engineer some pressure on the b2 pawn. So we actually want our opponent to play knight d5. We're just going to move our queen back to its initial square. And if the knights get traded, then our bishop is an absolute monster, and our other knight can finally uh, move up to b4, uh, to d4. Well, g4, I'm not scared of this at all. Again, we're resisting the temptation to play knight d4. Let's go b5. Let's go b5. a3. Well, that doesn't stop us. In fact, it encourages us to carry out our main plan. When you have a queen on a5 like this, and there's an undefended rook on a1, that is a clear sign that you can still get away with the move b4. And white is already losing, actually. White is just losing tactically, because the knight has nowhere to go. Um, if it moves back to d1, then we finally jump into d4, and then by force we win the rook in the corner. And if white goes elsewhere, he's just going to start dropping all of the queenside pawns. Why couldn't white play knight takes b5 here? Um, that's something that you can try to determine as I'm playing. So you can pause the video, rewind, and a uh, good little tactical test. Why couldn't white play, or what would have happened if white had played in this position, uh, knight takes b5? Which, of course, I, I did anticipate. OK, so here, uh, another interesting moment. Bishop takes a3 is probably most people's instinct, but I actually really dislike that move. I think that's a very short-sighted and greedy move, because the bishop on a3 is going to be essentially stuck there. And I've talked about this already several times. When you have a fianchettoed bishop, uh, you want to be very, very careful about leaving that diagonal, because then the dark square weaknesses around your king are going to uh, are going to hurt you. So I'd be very, very worried about white developing a kingside attack with a move like f5. And with our bishop away from home, uh, it's going to make the possibility of kind of a lollies mate with f6 and then the queen coming to h6 much more realistic. So the mature move is actually just to drop back to g7. This is not an easy move for a lot of people to play, but it's going to win the game a lot faster. Now, anytime white pushes f5, your instinct should be to uh, occupy this newly created outpost on e5. This happens very often. This is the main drawback of f5. And we're not afraid of any of this uh, because white's queen side is falling apart. Now, we really want to play b3. But we can't play b3 because it blunders the queen. Well, if you're thinking like that, then uh, you've already committed a mistake. Um, you're assuming that you can't play b3 because you blunder the queen. But what if we actually force ourselves to calculate? Well, the moment I say that, you should kind of understand uh, the crux of what I'm saying. You actually can play b3. Bishop takes a5. We can take the rook, and promotion is unstoppable. Yeah, nice little tactical detail. Yeah, that is a baller move. I didn't see this immediately, actually. At first, I was going to play queen a4, but I forced myself to consider a move that I thought was impossible. And so the more you limit yourself and prevent yourself from considering certain moves, uh, the less likely it is that you're going to find a creative solution. Creativity, I think, is partially the ability to consider moves that a lot of people wouldn't even start to consider. Like, the hard part is not calculating b3. It's allowing yourself to look at this move. And that's a big distinction that you should hold in your mind. Some moves, uh, they're pretty easy to see and very hard to calculate. It's hard to understand if they're good or bad. Some moves, the difficulty lies in simply allowing yourself to look at it for more than one second. 
And this is a good example of that. Yeah. Our opponent is dumbfounded. And B takes A2. Now you might say, well, what about bishop C3? Well, obviously there we just trade bishops and promote our pawn. That's it. The game is over. We make a new queen. There actually wasn't even as big of a rush to do that. But here we can just start mopping up uh, hanging pieces. At this point, everything I said about like Fianchetto bishops go out the window because we're up 100 different pieces. I think just taking the bishop is the simplest approach. It's hanging. Why not? Of course, I could also probably have played bishop takes d4 first, but avoiding complications, especially when we can just pick up a minor piece, is a good idea. And that's it. Bishop h3, our opponent hits our queen. Again, we can play bishop takes d4. At this point, I think there's no reason not to play bishop takes d4 check. And of course, we pick it up with our queen, and then the knight jumps into the action uh, by capturing another pawn. Alternatively, Okay, especially the moment white plays king g3, first thing I see is that the king and the queen are aligned, which leads me to ask, okay, can we set up some sort of a pin? Well, the best way to do that is rook a b8. We're threatening rook b3, we're getting a rook into the game. And there's basically no way to stop it because white's out of pieces. And white resigns. Okay, so a short game, but very kind of conceptually heavy. Um, it's pretty late, so I'm not gonna take too long here to summarize, but just a couple of important observations. Uh, we're going to face this type of move quite a bit. Um, it seems that people at this level really like to put something on c4, uh, either a bishop or a pawn. And again, this is not a terrible move if white follows it up properly. And the proper way to follow it up, by the way, is for white to basically um, to basically execute the same exact setup that, uh, that we did, uh, the Botvinnik setup. So the people who play this intentionally, the move c4, what they do is that they play g3, they fianchetto and they basically copycat our setup. d6, d3. Uh, here, actually, I like knight f6, but if we play e6, which is also possible, they play knight e2. And we get this very interesting kind of semi-symmetrical position where, of course, white has a hole on d4, but this hole on d4 is not as significant as it may appear. And the hole can be filled uh, with the move bishop e3. White is already kind of threatening to play d4 and eradicate uh, the weakness on that square. So this would be a good opportunity to put the knight on d4. But this is a separate line. I won't talk about this right now. But what you should remember is that, first of all, the Botvinnik setup, it's always a good idea to start with d6. Uh, when you try to cut corners and start with e6, here it would be possible to start with e6, uh, possible and maybe even more accurate. But as I've mentioned in previous speedruns, you have to be very careful about allowing a particular type of nasty idea, which is this clamp on the d6 square. White plays e5, and if you sleep through this moment, suddenly you'll find that you, you're not able to push your d-pawn at all. This is a scenario to avoid at all costs because white's got this massive, massive clamp, uh, and this can lead to some serious problems on the dark squares. So here you should rush to play the move d6, but why allow this scenario at all when you can just start with d6 to prevent e5? d3, and bishop g4, All right? So here, concrete considerations override the general principle about not moving a piece more than once because there's a much more important factor at play here. We want to uh, really ensure our monopoly over the d4 square. Now we complete the Bovenik setup, e6 and knight e7, queen to d1, whatever our opponent is playing, kind of meaningless moves. We complete our development, and now we proceed with the typical plan of executing a6 and b5. And I can show you a lot of examples of kind of a very, very similar uh, type of game where black does the exact same thing uh, against like a completely different setup. So for instance, one game that comes to mind, there it is. Okay, the alignment is a little bit off, but you get the point. Watch how this game proceeds. So this starts out as a completely different opening, King's Indian attack by white. And here, the only big difference is that my knight is on f6 rather than on e7. But the general idea is the same. Knight b to d2, knight c6, rook e1. And here, same thing. Rook b8. In many of these Sicilian positions, you're preparing queenside expansion. And here also, I bring the bishop out to g4, exchange it for the knight, and drop the knight back to d7 in order to extend your control of the d4 square and open up this long diagonal. And here we go, a6 and b5. Same general concept, c3, b4. Again, what is the point of this? We're trying to force this pawn away from c3 
so that we have this outpost on d4. Um, so your big takeaway for this game should be um, should be two big things. The Botvinnik setup against a lot of anti-Sicilians, for instance, in the closed Sicilian, I recommend exactly the same setup, g6, d3, bishop, g7. I mean, here there's a lot of possibilities for white, but a lot of people play f4. Same thing, e6 and knight g7. And here as well, a6 and b5 is a one of black's major plans. Um, so, yeah, so trade, knight g7 cancels. Queen a5, hitting the knight. Bishop to d2. A lot of you were asking why uh, we couldn't play queen a5 earlier, like here. And uh, some of you noticed that we can win a pawn by taking on c3 and taking on a2. Perfect example of... Uh, not seeing the forest for the trees. Yes, you win a pawn, congratulations, but what have you given up in return? You've given up your fianchettoed bishop. You've given up control over the d4 square because now it's firmly controlled by white's pawn. Your king now has nowhere to castle because, well, if you castle kingside, you're doing it without the bishop. And you've given white a bunch of time as well as potentially uh, leading your queen into trouble. So you might have to burn even more time trying to evacuate the queen at, at which point you're down a bunch of development. You get the point. White can expand in the center. So nobody's noticing the extra pawn that you want on a2. Always consider what you're giving up. Don't just blindly grab a pawn, especially if it involves exchanges of minor pieces. Um, okay. So queen a5, bishop d2, a6, g4, b5. Hopefully you were able to figure out what the intended response to knight takes b5 was. Um, there's probably more than one good move, but the simplest is just queen b6. And white is totally busted because after knight takes d6, we have this double attack. Knight d4 hitting the queen and hitting the knight. If white drops the knight elsewhere, then we dive in with queen takes b2. Rook d1. Many things that black can do here. I'll leave the deep analysis to the viewer, but queen a3 is one possibility. And just evacuating the queen back through a5. Now we're threatening the fork. This is a complete disaster for white. Once the queen side opens up, all these pieces start getting loose, and the king side isn't safe either. So that was the tactical reason. A3 walks right into B4, and now we have this lovely tactic. We drop the bishop to G7, so again, not just blindly grabbing free material, but starting to consider what the pros and cons are. And B3 was the game-winning tactic. That was the MVP move. Technically, maybe white can play a move like rook b2, but then we just grab a3. And that's it. Yeah, once b takes a2 happens, uh, the pawn promotes by force. Everything that you see is part of a larger pattern. Like a move like b3 uh, is not as uncommon as you might think it is. Uh, the, I think, most common manifestation of this type of tactic, just off the top of my head, uh, one example would be, okay, and like a perk, just like ignore the moves. I'm just trying to show, illustrate concept. Ignore the actual moves. Okay, so for instance, situation like this, black to play, right? There's two key indicators that this tactic um, might be at play. The first is that white is very poorly developed on one side of the board. Uh, the other is that a lot of white's pieces are kind of shuttled away on the king side. So queen takes a2 is uh, kind of a classic. Same concept, right? White Despite having all his, all his pieces on the board, white simply can't stop promotion. Um, so this is not as uncommon as you might think. Not exactly the same, but you get the, get the gist of it. Here again, everything is stuck on its initial square. The queen is away on the other side of the board. And so a move like b3 is not that crazy. Thanks for the sub. And that's about it. We pick up the bishop and we're up 1,000 pieces. So a lot of concepts here that, uh, that you can kind of uh, review on your own. I only addressed some of them. Again, one step at a time. We're going to get these anti-Sicilians again, and I might go a little bit deeper into the specifics of the theory uh, or why the setup is good. But for now, just remember the Botvinnik setup. Uh, remember often to start with d6 and the fight for the d4 square. We had two games uh, where there was a big kind of fight for a central square. Um, and often it's worth violating some of the more general principles in order to secure your control over a big central outpost. Okay, guys, it's late. I'm going to end for today, and I'll see you later.